name is Ellie Gold. I'm the president of the Gold Institute for International Strategy here in Washington, D.C. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Mark Black, a senior law enforcement fellow at our institute, uh, to discuss what happened and, and his experiences on 9-11, the day that changed America. It is very important to really, to really understand from people on the ground what their experiences were and what they've learned from that day. Uh, Mark Black is, is somebody who spent much of his career, if not most of his career, in law enforcement in the NYPD, uh, in various different departments and with various different units. And that day to him was extremely, extremely uh, moving and life changing as he is the only survivor of his unit from that time. I felt that for those reasons, it's important to hear from Mark exactly what those experiences are. Today is uh, Tuesday, the 14th of September. And the reason we are having this conversation today, as opposed to on 9-11, is because I felt that his story, in many ways, is unique and needed to be heard to continue the remembrance and the understanding of, the, of what happened and how America has changed. Let me bring in uh, Mark and uh, to, to begin this conversation. Good morning, Ali. How are you? Good morning, Mark. How are you? Good, thank you. And uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, first of all, t tell me before before we even get into into what happened that day. Just if you can give me your background with with with. NYPD prior to 9-11. So the 10th of, uh, of September th uh, uh, 2001 uh, and, and, pr and, and prior. What was your experience with, uh, with NYPD and, and working in New York City? So I came on, on NYPD or on the job in March 1st of 2000. So you can consider myself a rookie when 9-11 occurred. Sure. Uh, the academy took approximately about uh, eight months, seven to eight months in that realm. And then I was sent to the seventh precinct in Manhattan. For those of you who know Manhattan, the seventh precinct is located on the Lower East Side next to uh, the Williamsburg Bridge. And um, my patrol area was essentially we had from the Williamsburg Bridge area from Houston Street all the way down towards the water on the Lower East Side uh, as well. We had uh, streets that you might have heard of, uh, Delancey, Orchard Street, Irvington, Henry Street. These are some familiar streets uh, that are well known. And that's where I started my, my career with the NYPD, the 7th Precinct. It's excellent. So tell me, so t tell us, tell us uh, what happened on 9-11. You wake up in the morning and what, what was going on for, for, and this is, and, and my questions are not around, uh, not based around New York City, not based around NYPD per se, but really he, uh, every question that I ask you today is based around Mark Black. Sure. So uh, it was a typical Tuesday morning. I did what they call the day tour. Uh, my tour would be from seven o'clock, or we say zero seven hundred, to about uh, three forty in the afternoon, or fifteen forty in the afternoon. So I would be uh, in the locker room about six thirty in the morning, uh, preparing my day, and uh, basically uh, going to the locker room, checking out my equipment, checking out my uniform, and then heading down to roll call. Um, like a typical patrol day for any patrol patrol person or patrolman uh, in, in New York City with the NYPD. And it's funny, um, I still have something here that I can show the audience that every patrol person has something called a memo book. And this memo book really um, it 
you start off your day, you, you explain in the memo book the day, uh, the tours that you're doing, who roll call, your assignments that you're going to receive from that day, uh, checking the RMP, that's the patrol car, checking it if there's any defects in the car, checking the radios, everything like that. And then you're given your assignment. And uh, my assignment that day was, uh, according to this, the assignment was uh, Sector Boyd and Sector Frank. That would be in the Henry Street area of the Lower East Side. And um, I had a partner that day as well. And then we we basically started our patrol. And um, through the patrol, through the memo book that I see here, which became so important for a lot of us who were down at the site during 9-11, this, this I don't even take out. This is kept under lock and key to protect it because this patrol book not only explains the day and my assignments of the day, but for the future of any injuries that could occur from 9-11, this was documentation that, that we were there, that we were at the site. And apparently we had a radio call here to 146 Henry Street at 8.44 in the morning. But at 8.48, we heard the planes and my partner and I responded to the World Trade Center approximately from Henry Street with lights and sirens to Vesey, if you know the area of where the post office is in that general area, you're talking maybe five minutes. And um, that's roughly how long it took us to get there. I do remember that um, when we first got there, we heard the boom on Henry Street. In other words, that was the first plane that made impact with the World Trade Center. But we were facing east towards the East River when it happened on Henry. We saw a lot of people pointing back west, and that's when we decided to get in our patrol car and then head over to into um, to the site. What I do remember um, once we got there was there wasn't much debris on the ground. It was paper, that sort of stuff flying down. We entered the World Trade Center, those of you who know it, on the north side of the mall, the inside mall. And from there, I remember being very dark and hazy and water. And my partner and I um, ran to, um, Aaron Jackson and I, he was my partner, ran to um, the North Tower. Now I had worked there before I was a, before I was a, with NYPD, I was an underwriter in the insurance industry. So I knew the layout and our offices were there in, in, the, in, in the World Trade Center. So I went to the lobby and I said, and I said to my partner, I said, if you, if you go up the, to the promenade internally, up to the promenade, there's no protection. There were so many people coming down at the time we got separated and I found myself without my partner, which is, wasn't the best situation. But what I what did happen was people were coming down the escalators burnt who had made it down. And what happened was um, ladies who use hairspray, remember all those products are petroleum based, your clothing, polyester is petroleum based. So all these people were coming down with, with whose hair was sizzling and smothering and their clothes were embedded now into their skin. There was a lot of burns, uh, a lot of frantic people. I found myself at one point being alone down there. So at the mall, at the, uh, you would call it the elevator banks towards the mall area, I was directing people east. And if you remember, there's a Borders Books there, people who are familiar with the, with the layout back then, to get them to get to that part of the, of the uh, World Trade Center on that end, um, away from um, the tower. While I was there, uh, plane two had hit, and I remember this very large chandelier I thought was going to come off the ceiling and, and fall on me. Luckily it didn't. Um, at that time, I came in contact with P.O. Suarez, who was from TD4. A TD is a transit district, and TD4 is located in Union Square. Apparently him and his partner came, and uh, we started working together. Um, and basically what would happen is as the injured came down, when I saw uh, Officer Suarez, 
um, I would take down some basic information of the individual in case they lost consciousness. So for instance, their name, date of birth, something as basic as that, stick it in their pocket. And then Officer Suarez would go to the, go east. And apparently by that time, there were ambulances that were assembling. Um, did, did you uh, ha uh, see, did you ever find your partner after that? Yeah, I was gonna get to the story, yeah. Okay. So what happened was um, there were some um, people who came down again, sent them off. There was a maintenance worker, I remember. It was just him and I in the middle of the lobby. I said, listen, there's nothing we can do. I had escorted, it was escorting some burn victims back east towards um, the ambulances in, internally in the mall. And then it hit me, oh my God, where's my partner? I ran all the way back into the World Trade Center and, and, and found my partner who was coming down and uh, he basically said he was outside and he was witnessing what he was witnessing, uh, people falling and more debris. And he says, listen, we gotta get out of here. So we scrambled uh, out and uh, when we got outside, I, haven't be, I was not outside for a while at this point. There, there was total destruction already because of all the debris that had fallen. Sure. Our car was basically destroyed from the back hood, uh, excuse me, I say the back roof to the hood, the debris was just covered in it. We had gotten back, uh, at this time, things were getting precarious. He was a senior officer, so I followed his directions. It was really surreal um, at this point because what you saw were a lot of tourists there were taking pictures, believe it or not. And it was, it was really surreal as this was happening and they wouldn't get out of the way as we're trying to get a, evacuate ourselves out of this situation. And um, true New Yorkers were just running north. Um, we had gotten back to the precinct and by this time everything had was destroyed at the World Trade Center site. But um, there was an alert that went out if anybody had met anybody um, and at this time, you have to remember, I'm from the 7th Precinct and uh, Suarez and his group from a different, different precinct altogether. We had never met ourselves, met, met. All I remember was his tattoo and we wear collar brass. If you ever are in New York City, you will sure. notice that every patrol person has collar brass. And I remembered uh, TD4. The next day when I responded, I spoke to my sergeant and asked, I said, listen, they came out with a list of missing people. And what happened was the TD4 people had showed up on that list. From there, I was then uh, interviewed by not only the PBA, but ESU. And um, unbeknownst to me, sorry, I'm getting choked up. Sure they were they had video coverage believe news coverage of suarez bringing out wounded so they were trying to take my interview and compare it with the video uh, of the news coverage for that day to get some sort of idea of where they can begin to search for him and possibly his own partner that he was down there with right. that of course it was such a mess it couldn't be done I then uh, had to go to TD4 and speak to the CEO of that command. What really ironic though, is what I'm about to tell you, that's something that happened. After, after uh, people had known that I was on my second master's and writing about writing on terrorism and so on and so forth, they had sent me to another unit. Well, at this unit, this other unit, I was asked to retrieve unmarked vehicles and as we went to the location where the unmarked vehicles were, there was recovery of vehicles that were down at the site of 9-11. And on one of the unmarked vehicles, handwritten in the dust of the vehicle was Suarez and Ellis. Suarez is the person I had worked with from TD4 and Ellis was the partner of, of Suarez from TD4. I immediately went to the pound and it was going to be a rainstorm. I wanted to get the car in, inside 
so that not only is it evidence, but maybe a location could be found where the, where the vehicle was towed from. Unfortunately, from what I was, what was explained to me that, that day, which was a several days later after 9-11 when I had to go to this other unit, um, NYPD tow took notes of where the vehicles were recovered from. If it was Department of Transportation, they didn't take the notes as well and they just pulled the cars. Unfortunately, those vehicles were were um, were taken by, from what I understand, the Department of Transportation tow. That's what it was explained to me back then. And then uh, another thing that happened was later on in the day of 9-11, one of my cousins <laughs> comes walking. Now you have to understand, 9-11 pretty much shut down all transportation in the city. Sure. People were walking across the bridges right, all over right. the place. Out of nowhere, my cousin comes up right across my precinct, covered in stuff. I gave him the keys to my apartment. I said, just hunker down there. And one of the other things that happened is people who remember about 9-11 being in the city, all communications went down. That means right. your telephones. For whatever reason, there was a hard line one hard line working in my precinct. And I immediately asked to call my parents who lived out of state just to let them know I was okay. And I did, the actual, the line did work and I got through. It was a five minute call, I'm okay, blah, blah, blah. And I just hung up and that was it, so they knew. And then we went on to some, um, the tours, the tours began, uh, they decided to put everybody on 12 hour tours. Uh, if my uh, recollection, it was, four o'clock in the morning to 4 p.m. in the afternoon, everybody was assigned. And they put me, because I was down at the site there, they didn't want me to go back down. They put me, my first day, uh, two days, was at the Williamsburg Bridge. Let and me interrupt you for a moment. Uh, uh, were you, you in the, uh, or at the, the towers when they fell, or were you already back at the precinct? I think we were already, when they, when they were, when, the, the the debris was already falling, but when we got there, the towers were already, yeah, they were they were coming down. Okay. Yeah, the, the debris when we got there were constantly falling. It was falling, and then when we left with our RMP, they were come they were already coming down. When we got back, there was nothing. Right. Okay. So by the time you you left, they were still standing, although debris was coming down. But by the time you got back, the towers had already fallen. Yeah, they were they were they were gone. They, they, there was there was. I think at the, the after the second plane hit, I don't know how much time, but we 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 my scene basically, I owe my life to Aaron Jackson, the senior my senior partner. He already had some like seventeen years on. I was a rookie. He was like, "This is above us. We can't communicate on the radio." The radio was so saturated, you couldn't you couldn't get anything over. A matter of fact we didn't realize this when we got back to the precinct they thought that we were dead wow yeah how when many we got people back into the precinct we there are precinct people looked at us like we were ghosts they they did not they thought that we because they heard us on the initial radio call see each precinct has its own or shares its own radio frequencies with maybe one or two other precincts sure. they heard us responding they did not hear anything after that and it would be almost impossible because it was so saturated with with communications. Right, and what did and you uh, the rest of your unit? Uh, it was only Aaron and I. It was only Aaron and I from the seven precinct at that who went in. We were not with a unit. It was Suarez and the TD four, TD four. Okay, so, so we never met. We never met TD four guys and the maintenance workers there and whoever else. We never knew each other. We, right. So the people that you were, the people that you were on the ground with at the time, they did not make it. Correct. Uh, okay. So that was, so I just want to clarify in my opening, I had said that your unit uh, had not, uh, had not uh, uh, made it back, but it was in reality, your, uh, the people that you were on the ground with. Correct. Uh, it's not typically your, uh, your, uh, your unit to, to, to go to the towers, but you ha you did because that was uh, because of your proximity. Correct. Yep. Okay, I understand. Right. Yeah, 
And it wasn't just us who went. Any, you had precinct one, you know, the first precinct who, who's down there, fifth, the ninth. Um, you have people from the 13th precinct. Basically, a lot of lower Manhattan, when they saw this, just went went down. They just all responded. Right. Sure. And now, okay, so now it's afterwards. You now have a, you're on a 12 hour shift. So we're on 12 hours. They didn't want me to go back down. So they put me on the Williamsburg Bridge, and this is really remarkable. What most people cannot appreciate about 9 11 was the support that was coming in in the waves and waves. So uh, Poland Spring Water, the big water trucks that they make deliveries at the supermarkets. I can't tell you if I timed 10 minutes coming over to Williamsburg Bridge, there was a convoy of these green trucks going all the way down. You had the iron workers bringing in their heavy, heavy equipment over the Williamsburg. It was it was amazing. I always said if, if there was an NFL draft and you wanted the biggest guys you can get, you should have seen some of these guys with the iron workers coming over the Williamsburg Bridge. It was amazing. It was it was just non nonstop. And um, all going to the site, all going. Now, what to did what did you see? What did you learn on that day about America, about America and Americans? You be, you're beginning to describe it right now, but well, tell us a, what is it that 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 I I'm I was in Baltimore at the time, uh, not not a stranger to New York. But what is it? What is it that you saw you as a New Yorker that you that maybe surprised you or stood out to you about America and Americans in that time? Well, everybody at that point was giving a hand. I mean, it, it was everybody, civilians. Matter of fact, there was so much food coming into the precinct. It was it was cra it was unbelievable the amount of food that was coming in. The amount of support was was unbelievable. I have not seen that sort sort of support ever in any situation than it was 9-11. Matter of fact, you can say in a way, crime almost stopped. Crime almost stopped. Even, even the local bad guys took a hiatus for a little while. It was, um, everybody was, uh, it was unbelievable. Um, you know, it's sad, the world trade, what people have to realize is that site became the World Trade Center site became one of the world's largest crime scenes post World War II, and that's something that has to be reinforced today. It is still one of the world's, or one of modern history's largest crime scene, and the support that everybody was given, first the support to first responders, I have never seen before. It was um, it was unbelievable. So, so tell tell me, you you've now spent tw you've now spent uh, twenty plus years or twenty years since that day, and you have focused on a variety of different areas within law enforcement. Uh, you now travel the country uh, along with some of our other law enforcement fellows, and you educate people. You educate law enforcement, you educate civilians on how, um, on, on, on various areas of law enforcement. As you indicated before, you were working on a master's in, in, in terrorism or counterterrorism. What have you seen? What has, what have you seen change over these past 10 years, uh, 20 years? Uh, in, in particular, talking about fighting terrorism. I mean, again, this is, this is not a, a law enforcement podcast. This is your right. reminiscence on 9-11. What has changed with regards to terrorism from, from before 9-11 to after 9-11? As I said in my intro, the country has changed on 9-11. We are, we are different people. Tell me, what have you learned since 9-11? Well, I think when I was in grad school uh, for my second master's in protection management, pre-9-11, um, I don't believe that the, the American public 
appreciated um, the ramifications of a terrorist act. I mean, we saw 1993, we saw internationally our embassies get attacked in, in Kenya, but I don't think they, they fully comprehended it until it came to our shores. And that set up a totally different dynamic. After 9-11, I the, the the man on the street or the woman on the street, so to speak, was very, very concerned, extremely, extremely concerned. And then as um, we had the, 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 the support of the American public and what we saw um, our policing and our investigative wings start to uh, do more intensive work on tracking these individuals down, the American public uh, started to feel, um, I should say, a little bit of at, at ease. And that was in right after the 9-11 for, for about five years or so, having done police work up until 2020. But then what we see is as time goes on, like everything else, we get a little lax, lackadaisic. And um, although we, we stopped a lot of attacks, <clears throat> I think what has happened is we've forgotten a lot about what happened on 9-11. And that you can just see in the way that our, our government officials talk about terrorism and have politicized it. Instead of just being very direct and saying it's a crime and we're gonna go after these criminals either on our shores or we're gonna go overseas and get them. And I think what's, what's, what's so ironic is that what has just happened with the exodus of us leaving Afghanistan, 9-11 and the close proximity and dates of when this happened to, to the date of 9-11 is that this has brought uh, the conversation of terrorism and how the United States should counter it back into the public domain. And I think it's a healthy conversation. I also think that people right now are a little nervous about the resurgence of terrorism domestically within the United States. And I think uh -huh. that, that what I feel uh, from, a, from speaking to people, the, the conversations are very reminiscent of post 9-11, even three years after, because it was fresh in everybody's mind. So I see our country again, once on, is on edge again. And I think the country again is looking towards law enforcement and towards uh, uh, leadership within the United States to counter this. So it's, it's very interesting. You know, the old saying, what's new again is old again. What's old again is new again. Um, it, it's, 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 it's like a complete circle from nine 11. In your and, and, and here's a very, something very interesting too. You mentioned Ellie, not to cut you off. There's a lot of young law enforcement that I go out and we, I meet, and a lot of them, you have to remember, some of them are just coming on the job. Some of them are 22 years old, 23. So they don't have the memories of nine 11. They don't see it. And there's there's a, something very interesting that's happened that um, they're looking they're looking for those people to act as mentors or act who were involved in the stuff to provide them insight and knowledge how to counter this. And and this is very, very important. Um, you know, with this whole defund the police movement, a lot of that experience who used to work in this field and used to work in regular investigations, not even in counterterrorism investigation, but regular, all that mentorship and insight and vocational knowledge has left, has walked off. They, they left. So they, these younger um, uh, people who are starting off in their careers in law enforcement are so thirsty for knowledge on, on what is this all about? Because they have not witnessed it before. A lot of them may have not gone to a mass casualty incident before. A lot of them have not really maybe been trained up and are starting to get trained up in this and just are just so curious and want more knowledge. So if this event does happen, a, a similar event, a terrorist event does happen in their community, that they, they are prepared. And um, that's, that's very, very interesting. They're, they're seeking out this knowledge.
So in the, in, in the last 45 seconds that we have, what can you tell people who, who may be concerned about a, 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 a rise in terror, as you just described, post-Afghanistan um, or the current, in the current law enforcement environment? What can you tell them um, to, 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 to look for? or to, to at least put them at ease, if at all? Well, I mean, I, I left a year ago. So my thing is that there are still good men and women working in the counterterrorism uh, field, both in law, in law enforcement and in our, our military apparatus and in our intelligence apparatus who are doing everything that they can. What, what the American public has to realize is that these are not uh, easy investigations. This isn't a one hour show on TV and at the end you catch the bad guy. These are very involved investigations and they really do need support of from the American public, but they really do need support from our elected leadership so that we can be proactive and the people who are still working in, in this realm can be proactive to, to stop before it happens uh, a severity event such as terrorism. I will say this, that we are in a precarious realm across law enforcement where morale is not that high, but the people sometimes, and such as myself, you don't listen to the noise. You have a mission in front of you and to, you're going to complete it to the best of your ability. And it's those men and women who are out there that aren't listening to the noise, aren't listening to the politicians, aren't listening to the news. They have a mission, they're driven, and they're going to find these people. They will find them. And what we need to do as, as a society right now is that we need to have the support of the public. We need to have the support of the public and the support really for these fine men and women who are gonna carry out this mission and carry out these investigations to seek and find and stop these terrorist criminals. Thank you, Mark. Your, your, uh, your stories, your comments today are so important for people to remember. Um, and again, as I said, today is uh, September 14th, and we purposely waited until after September 11th to have this conversation. As uh, as the the uh, the the 9/11 activities uh, are, are winding down, I wanted to have one final uh, conversation, one final reminiscence about uh, about that day um, from somebody who's been there but also from somebody who can uh, tell us uh, what, you, what you've learned uh, and how you've put it into practice. Uh, and in fact, give, give a sense as to what you see coming, which you have done uh, so well. So I wanna thank you for this. Um, and I wanna thank you also for the continued work that you do at the Gold Institute, uh, focusing on law enforcement. In fact, I know that we're going to be having a, another recorded conversation in the next uh, week or so and uh, to continue the work that you do. So uh, I just want to thank you for your service to New York, service to the country, and continued support at the Gold Institute. Thank you, Ellie. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I'm Martin Johnson with the Gold Institute for International Strategy. I've been in law enforcement for 36 years, 25 years of doing it and 11 years of teaching it. I look for details and solutions. I always did. The Gold Institute does the same thing, paying particular attention to national security issues. Perspectives from domestic and international sources are always considered. They're always intertwined, no matter what the topic. The Institute uses research and active study as tools to define issues look for solutions, find the pathways, establish goals, and get the ball rolling.
You can write all the papers in the world and do all the research in the world, but if you don't get the ball rolling, how much good have you done? The Institute has solid leadership, has an awful lot of very smart people whom I've had the privilege to meet. I've learned a lot. You can learn a lot too. There's an awful lot of good work being done. Please feel free to check out the website, look at the mission statement, follow them up. It's worth it. It really is. I'm very happy to be part of it, and I look forward to continuing my relationship with the Gold Institute for International Strategy. Thank you.